Now, if you are a fifth or sixth grader, you will want to check out Pivot. You will make new friends and get truth from the Bible to help you through those middle school years. Pivot meets every Sunday at 9 and Wednesdays at 6.30 in the lower level of the student ministry area. The Ministry of Liberty Hill depends on many volunteers who use their heart and ability in different areas of the ministry to bless our church and community. If you would like to join a ministry team, please click on I Want to Help on the app. Fill in the brief form and a ministry leader will contact you to help you find the right place for you to serve. The Ministry of Liberty Hill depends on many volunteers who use their hearts and ability in different areas of ministry to bless our church and community. If you would like to join a ministry team, please click on I Want to Help on the app. Fill in the brief form and a ministry leader will contact you to help you find the right place for you to serve. Life groups are the way to make connections with your Liberty Hill Church family. You study the Bible with a small group of people to get wisdom for your life. Enjoy the support of friends through the ups and downs. You can find a list of life groups on the Liberty Hill Church app. Liberty Hill Church wants to help families get off to a good start. And to do this, we will provide gift baskets for expectant mothers and to couples who are getting married from our church family. These baskets will provide some of the basic needs to help you in this exciting time of your life. Simply click on Are You Expecting or Getting Married Soon on the Liberty Hill Church app to let us know of your happy event. Thank you for being a part of our online community today. We encourage you to share comments and prayer requests as you worship. And if you have any questions or prayer requests for our pastors, please feel free to contact them on our app or at libertyhill.church. We're praying that God will use this service to help you draw closer to Him. If you want to know what is happening at Liberty Hill, download the Liberty Hill Church app on the App Store or Google Play. You can see what events are coming soon, register for them, and give to the church, all on the app. Would you click check in on the church app today to let us know you are here? It's just a small way of helping us stay connected with you. Hilltop Kids is our ministry to kids from babies up through the fourth grade. It's a place where kids have a lot of fun while they learn about God's love and His plan for their lives. Kids can join them every Sunday morning at 9 and 10.30 and Wednesday nights at 6.30. If you are a fifth or sixth grader, you want to check out Pivot. You will make new friends and get truth from the Bible to help you through the middle school year. Pivot meets every Sunday at 9 and Wednesdays at 6.30 in the lower level of the student ministry area. Students in 7th through 12th grades, have you tried the Hub? It's a place to connect with other students and adults who know what it is like to be your age and you will find that the Bible has truth that will help you where you are today. The Hub meets on Wednesday nights at 6.30 and also every Sunday morning at 9. Thank you for being a part of our online community today. 
We encourage you to share comments and prayer requests as you worship. If you have questions or prayer requests for our pastors, feel free to contact them on our app or at Liberty Hill. Series talking about being blessed and blessing others. Today we're specifically talking about blessing the ages. We're going to talk about growing old gracefully. Stay with us. Our service is going to begin in just a moment. But first, here's a look at this week's news and announcements. Thanks, Pastor Joe. The Liberty Hill Church app is a great way to know what is happening at our church and to find tools to grow closer to God. You register for events, see our bulletin, and take sermon notes. Download it at the App Store or Google Play. Would you take a minute to click Sunday check-in on the app? It lets us know that you are with us either online or here in the Worship Center. If you are new here, would you stop by the Welcome Center in the lobby before you leave today? You'll be greeted by a friendly face who will be happy to meet you and give you a small gift to show how our appreciation for your being with us. You can bless a child in another country at Christmas time by donating gifts items to Operation Christmas Child. During the month of March, we will be collecting clothing for boys and girls ages five to nine. You can place gifts on the table in the lobby. Easter is three weeks from today. Please be in prayer for this big day. It's a great time to invite your friends to worship with you at Liberty Hill. You can pick up invitation cards in the lobby to give to your friends that will help them know more about your church family. You and your friends will have three opportunities to worship with us on Easter at 8, 9.30, and 11. Here's Brittany also our children's ministry director to tell you about Palm Sunday at Liberty Hill. March 24th is Palm Sunday. Hilltop Kids will be leading us in worship during both services. This is also a family worship service, which means there is no hub, pivot, or Hilltop classes. Once the Hilltop Kids are done leading worship, they will be released to sit with their families for the rest of the service. This Sunday, tonight, from 4 to 5 in the sanctuary, we will have our first practice for Palm Sunday. And also on March 17th, we'll be right here in the sanctuary again from 4 to 5 having our last practice before the big day. You can practice right now at home on the Liberty Hill Church app. Thanks, Brittany. Palm Sunday is two weeks from today. Here is Belinda Worley to tell you about Autism Day of Hope. Hey church, go to the church app today and register for an Autism Day of Hope. April 20th, doors open at 8 with the conference going from 9 until 12. It's going to be a fun day filled with strategies and a special guest speaker as well. The cost is just $10 and it's going to be a lot of fun. So go today and register. More details will come in future videos. Thanks, Belinda. If you would like to give to the Ministry of Liberty Hill, there are three ways you can give. You can give on our app at libertyhill.church and in the blue box in the lobby. Thank you for being here today. Let's all stand and worship with our team.
narrow road that leads to life, but I want to be on. Take you at your word. Take you at your word. If you said it, I believe it. I'll see how good it works. If you started, you completed. I'll take you at your word. Your word.
we're at that uh, beautiful time of the year where you can see and feel the seasons changing. And it's, it's always a reminder whenever we see the seasons change. It's a reminder that that's kind of a mirror of life, that we all go through different seasons and stages of life, that as we grow, we change and we face new challenges and new circumstances and new situations and sometimes things are in such a spot that we thought we would never be in this situation. We never thought life would take us this turn. But there's always been one constant in your life, regardless of what season you've been in, regardless of what stage of life, regardless of what has surprised you and taken you off guard, there has been one constant in your life, and that is that God has been reaching out to you at every turn, at every stage. God has constantly been saying, I've got you. I've got a plan for you. I want to save you. Jesus said that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's you and I. We sometimes find ourselves wandering through the seasons and the stages of life, but God never wonders as if he has no purpose and no direction. Do you need his salvation today? Do you need his direction? Do you need his guidance? He's reaching out to you, but you've got to receive it. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you with hearts of gratitude. Thank you, God, for how you have guided our paths, how you have made a way for us, that at every season and every stage of life, Father, you have patiently been seeking to love us, to teach us, to guide us, to save us. Father, today collectively we say yes to you and we ask you to teach us. And Father, I pray that individually each of us turns to you in our lives and say, God, save us, lead us, be our Lord, be our God. Thank you, God, for what you're going to do in our lives and in this service today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Please be seated. you missed the uh, opening announcement video where uh, Daniel talked about the fact that we are just two weeks away from Palm Sunday when we have our family worship service where Hilltop Kids will be here on stage and they'll listen worship and sing and then as a church we get to celebrate communion that day and that also means that it's three weeks away from Easter Sunday and I really encourage you to be praying for all our services on Palm Sunday and on Easter Sunday, be praying for all of our guests who are going to be here, be praying for all of our Liberty Hill people who are serving and, and inviting friends and family. And by the way, if you haven't started inviting friends and families to be with us on that Easter Sunday, I really encourage you to, to, to hurry up and begin your invitations now. And the reason why is if, if you wait too long to invite them, somebody from some other church is going to invite them and I mean, I guess that'll be all right, but I'd kind of rather have me here, all right? Can I get an amen? All right, that was biased. I'm sorry, but I still mean it. 
uh, be praying for the people that you're going to be inviting because it's, it's a worship time on Easter Sunday when people's hearts are open to the gospel unlike they are any other time of the year. It could be a great opportunity for someone's life to be eternally changed because of your invitation to bring them to church with you. All right, let's talk about something that is right here and now. Yesterday we had a really big day here at Liberty Hill with our annual Woven Women's Conference. Over 300 women were gathered together here at Liberty Hill to worship, and the theme was praise, and my goodness, they certainly did yesterday. It was a fantastic experience, and I am so grateful to all of our volunteers and leaders here at Liberty Hill who worked so hard and prayed so diligently and prepared for such a long period of time to be able to give these ladies a great experience and thankful to God that he moved in such a neat and wonderful way. It was great for me to be able to sit back and see God working through, working his gifts through so many people willing to make a difference. Church, could you help me say thank you to everybody who helped make that event happen? Uh, And just a side note, a couple of our Liberty Hill ladies uh, were preachers yesterday at Woven, and I sat back as I listened to them speak, and I thought, well, between the great preachers that we have on staff and the great preachers that we have that are members and attenders here at Liberty Hill, it looks like I'm going to get to retire soon. Uh, (laughs) It was just an amazing thing to witness, and I'm so thankful and proud of the people that make up our Liberty Hill family. Well, let's talk about what we're going to do today. Today, we're taking another step further in our series of Overflow, where we think about how God has blessed us individually And then the overflow of his blessings spill out to those around us. Today we're going to think differently in terms of how God blesses us. Rather than thinking about it as individual blessings, which we still should, I want us to think about generational blessings, how people in our age group, we would define ourselves as our generation, how God blesses in one generation and it is to overflow to another. So let's get started. In 1954, the controversial movie, it was controversial at that time, The Wild One premiered and starred Marlon Brando. Just a little side note, The Wild One was a fictional movie, but it was kind of a a take-off of an actual event that happened in Hollister, California that would eventually lead to the formation of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club. It was was really a a cultural shifting moment and, and, and historically significant movie at that at that time. Now, there's a particular scene in the movie, and, and this still shot from that famous scene from the movie. Here's Marlon Brando. His character is Johnny. Now, this is Mildred, and they're having a party, and they're, they're dancing, and the motorcycle club that Johnny and his friends are, are in, on the back of their leather jacket, on their patch, they've got BRMC, And Mildred asks what it stands for, and he says, well, it's the Black Rebels Motorcycle Club. And here's one of perhaps the most famous lines of the movie. Mildred asks Johnny, what are you rebelling against? And he says, I know some of you can quote this, he turns and he says, what have you got? It's a cool little line, because what he's saying, he says, I'm rebelling rebelling against whatever you've got. It doesn't matter what it is, I'm against it going to go my own way. I'm pushing back against whatever you think is good and acceptable. Different, but yet obviously similar. In 1955, a year later after the, the Wild One, James Dean portrayed Jim Stark. Now, Jim was a troubled young man, a, a, a confused young man, and he was rebelling against his parents, society in general. This was, again, an iconic movie Rebel without a cause. So it's different than the wild one in terms of its setting and in terms of its plot twist, but the general idea was the same. We're unsettled. We're angry. We're young, and as we're growing older, we're, we're rebelling against everything that we see out there. I don't understand life. I don't feel like I fit in, and I'm just, I'm against whatever is already there. Now, aside from the particular plots of these movies, this is a normal part of growing up. That all throughout human history, as young people have become, going from adolescence to young adulthood, there is this 
angst, this anxiety, this unsettledness that that just comes with youth as they're finding their own identity. It's actually an essential part of growing up. There's there's a slight breaking away from from your parents and from your grandparents or whoever home you've been in. You're shifting away from how you were raised to a degree and you're starting to explore life. Here's another example of this. Go a decade later, in 1964, a man by the name of Jack Weinberg coined a phrase that somewhat defined youthful rebellion. And the phrase that he came up with has been attributed to a lot of people, including the Beatles. But this man is the one who actually said the phrase, and this is him in the back of uh, the police car. He was a student at the University of California in Berkeley and was a student activist. Shocking that such things would exist in California, especially Berkeley at that time. But he coined the phrase, don't trust anyone over 30. And some of you have no doubt heard that phrase, even though this is obviously uttered a long time ago. And it kind of covered the entire feeling that people in their late teens and early 20s had towards society in general. Don't trust anyone over 30. Now, if I understand it correctly, Jack is still alive and he is well over 30, but I'm uncertain about whether he trusts himself or not. The 50s and 60s were a turning point in how rebellion works in society. Because television and movies were starting to take off. Radio was taking on this powerful new reach across America in ways like it hadn't before. And so for the first time in human history, people from all across America could identify with someone who they felt spoke for them. And so young people could go to the drive-in and see a movie, or, or they could hear on the radio this particular type of music and the lyrics, and it moved them, and they said, I can identify with it. First time in human history that as young people aged, they felt like they were a part of a movement that captured their feelings. Now, obviously, the mass media at that day and age is nothing like what it is today. Today, in an instant, you and I can read a tweet or a post on X or Instagram or Facebook or Snapchat or, God help you, TikTok, or whatever it may be, and in an instant, it can go viral. Thousands of people can read it, like it, repost it, and then in just a few minutes, hundreds of thousands of people could be on board with what someone has said done, displayed, whatever. Nothing like this in human history. And and the amazing thing about it is, is it gives new power to youthful rebellion that has always been there. And just a side note, this is a political point that I'm going to make here, but it isn't a matter of a political party. There are political leaders and leaders of particular movements and causes that will capitalize on that youthful angst and rebellion and unsettledness, and they will push and manipulate generations to carry out their own agenda. It's a newsflash. It's easy for people in positions of power to manipulate the masses to get their causes to a wider audience. Again, shocking, I know. But what we see in our day and age on a scale like we've never seen before would be unknown players, sometimes very known, manipulating the system to divide us in our society and across our world. That in a country that has gone through so much in its 200 plus years of history, people speculate and wonder, have we ever been so divided, even including the times of the Civil War? We're just not at a place where we would take up arms against one another, but have we ever been so divided as we are now? And part of the division comes down to generations distrusting one another. The young, skeptical of the old. The old, skeptical of the young. But here's what I want us to center in on today. God's plan is for generations to bless one another. God's plan is not for generations to be divided and to be at war over one another. God's plan is for generations to bless one another. Even in that normal aging process, 
where adolescents will begin to push away from the identity of their parents and the values of, of their parents that were passed on to them, that there will be some tension and friction that is natural. There still has to be an awareness, and there is in healthy relationships, that even though we may be at odds at times, we're still together in this world, and we are still united in our love and our care for one another. That's what God's plan is. This may seem like an odd thing to say, but expect yourself to improve as you age. There are drawbacks to being young. Some of the drawbacks to being young is you've not yet learned all you're going to learn. You you do not yet see all the perspectives that you will see as you gain new wisdom, new knowledge, new understanding throughout age. And as you are young, there are some opportunities you haven't yet experienced. But that doesn't mean you won't. When you are young, there seems to be, at times, more burdens and more rules upon you. And I assure you, there are not. It just feels heavier on you at this stage in your life. And of course, there are drawbacks to being older. As you get older, some things just feel different. And sometimes it isn't a good feeling. There are some mornings I get out of bed and I wish there was a way I could spray WD-40 on my shoulders and elbows. And there are times in which I walk past the mirror and I'm like, oh my gosh, who is this old guy that snuck into my house? And when is he going to take care of that gray in his beard? I used to tell Melanie before it became so gray, I had a skunk stripe going on here. Now it's just... <laughs> What's happening with the abominable snowman? I don't know. There are drawbacks to getting older. But I recognize this. It's a privilege to grow older. It's a privilege denied to a lot of people. When I think about young men and women who have left this world too soon, there are plenty of people around them that would love to have one more birthday one more holiday, one more vacation, one more meal together, one more laugh together. So to people who are my age, 30-ish and older, don't hate growing older. I know it's hard. Talks with my mom who spends all of her day in a wheelchair, and she has limited mobility, limited limited things that she could do. And she has often talked about what it is to grow older and to feel helpless. To know that here is a person who was once so energetic, so productive, so on top of everything, to now recognize that she has to let other people do things for her that she once would take pride in doing herself. But there is a treasure that comes with aging that you can't put a price tag on. Who you are in your 20s is not who you're going to be in your 30s. I know some of you have heard me say this several times. I can't stress this enough. You're going to be different 10 years from now. If you are graciously allowed 10 more years on this planet, you're going to be different in the future. The future you is not the same as the present you. You've got to be aware of that. How you will see the world when you're 40 will not be the same as how you see yourself or the world when you're 30, much less 20. When you get 50, the world takes on a whole different look. You don't just look differently on the outside as you age. You feel differently on the inside. Your perspective changes. And it's important for us as people who follow Christ together, that in every season, in every stage of our lives, we recognize the blessing that comes with it, and we don't dare face it alone. We are aware that every generation that is older than us and every generation that is younger than us has something to offer us, and we have something to offer them. The church needs to be a model 
of the older generation looking out for the younger generation and the younger generation looking out for the older generation. You won't get that in politics and you won't get that in any other organization or any other place in the world like you can get that done in the church. The church must model what a healthy civilization and society should look like. That people of different perspectives, of different understandings, of different insights can come together united around a common purpose and cause. And our common purpose and cause is to follow Jesus Christ because we believe he is the way, the truth, and the life. And then once we believe that, we come together to say this is what it looks like in all of the different stages of life to follow the way, the truth, and the life. And if you expect yourself to get better as you age, then you expect more of yourself. You recognize that you're going to change. Why not change for the better? Because we have all experienced, either firsthand or secondhand, what it is like to grow older ungracefully. And it is easy to grow older and bitter. It is easy to grow older and feel like life has dealt you a bad hand and to become bitter, cynical, angry at the world and angry at whoever happens to cross your path. Terrible way to live, not only for you, but also for anyone who does indeed happen to cross your path. So we want to set a goal to get better as we age. We want to grow wiser. We want to grow more loving, more caring. And this isn't just This isn't just my dream. This isn't just something I come up with. This is scriptural. Take a look at how God has something to teach us at every stage of our lives. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul wrote to a young man by the name of Titus. And in chapter 2 of verse 2, here's what Paul told Titus. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Catch what Paul is speaking to men as they age. That we're supposed to be clear thinking. We're supposed to be sober minded, meaning our thoughts should be better. Our thoughts should be more directed. Our thinking should improve. Our understanding should improve. The way we form judgments and opinions should get better as we age. And he tells us that we should be dignified, meaning that there should be a certain dignity that we have as we age, that We become more respectable as men. That as we age, we grow past our youthfulness into a stage of life that is marked with a certain respectfulness about us. Self-controlled, sound in faith, meaning that as we grow older in our years, we also grow deeper in our faith and in love. Meaning, as we grow older, we should love people better than we ever have before in our lives. As you age, is that your goal? Do you have that goal in yourself that you're going to say that as I age, I will not become an angry, bitter, cynical person? I'm instead going to become more loving, more respectable? My thinking is going to be more clear on difficult and complex issues? And that last one, steadfastness, meaning unmovable. And why not? Because if you have aged, you have gone through situations and circumstances that have tried you and tested you and have shook you to the core. Why not recognize that you have withstood all of the situations that life has thrown at you? Why not recognize that you have gone through all of your bad days and have made it to that point in your life? Why not become a person who is steadfast, unmovable, and strong like a rock that other people around you can lean on you and rely on you? This is the goal for men to pursue as they age. It's a worthy goal. Can I get an amen? Now Paul turns his attention in his letter to Titus to speak to women. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, reverent, respectable, honorable in behavior, not slanderers, gossips, people who talk in such a way to bring others down, or slaves to much wine. And perhaps some of you ladies caught under the word much there. It's how do you define much, right? Only have one glass. It's a really big glass. That's between you and God. 
They are to teach what is good. Did you catch that? They are to teach what is good. You know what teaching implies? You have somebody's attention. You can't teach unless someone is listening. And someone isn't listening unless there is something respectable about you that they are wanting to hear what you have to say. It also implies a relationship. So ladies, as you grow older, grow older in such a way that you are placing greater stress on what is most important, that you have understood the mysteries of life much better as you age and you have understood things far differently now at this stage in life than what you used to and you have learned lessons that can prevent someone else from suffering in ways that you have suffered Ladies, as you have aged, you have had your hearts broken, you have experienced sorrow, you have experienced frustration, and out of all of those, you have learned to cope with those issues. You have managed your emotions, your feelings. You have gone through incredibly trying situations in life. You have something to offer the next generation. So carry yourself in your demeanor, and in your attitude, in your language, carry yourself in such a way that younger ladies recognize that you have something to offer them that they need. Now Paul shifts to the next generation, and you can see the emphasis going toward the younger generation in verse 4. And so, again, still speaking to older women, so train the young women. I like that, training. There's an ongoing process. Train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. I recognize that some of these principles and ideas here in this verse seem outdated and and not fitting in modern times. That's a terrible shame because I can't think of anything more honorable than to be known for loving your family and taking care of them. doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. Is there anything more honorable in life than taking care of your family? Is there anything more honorable, more respectful, more important than knowing that the people under your rooftop are well cared for and secured and at peace. I recognize that not not every lady is going to be working at home. And listen, I, I get this. My wife is a small business owner. She's a professional woman. She has been a working mom, and she has worked in different capacities over the over the years, and has done a fantastic job at managing home and work. And there were times in her lives in which she was a stay-at-home mom, and there were times in her lives in which she was a working professional. So if you want more insight on that, check her on her feelings on this. But I want to encourage you, ladies, to not feel less than because you want to work at home and be a stay-at-home mom. It does not matter if the culture disapproves of that or not. Tell me, why is it honorable for you to go work for someone else than it is for you to work for your children and to work for your family at home? Tell me what is honorable about just being another taxpayer than being someone who is taking care of your family. We have placed a prize and a value on someone being a taxpayer and say, well, this is equal rights. Well, of course a woman can do what she wants to do. Why shouldn't she? But recognize that this is also the same culture that will now allow a man to dress up like a woman and beat up on women and women's sports and somehow be labeled as a, as a woman of the year. Do you want to take cues from a culture that will take women's rights and turn it upside down like that? Oh, I think I'm going to get the hate mail on that. Do you know what? I think I'd rather be called a transphobe than a coward. So why not make a stand for what is right and better, not just for present generation, but for future generations? And the idea of having a stable, secure, loving home is what has built the world. You're not going to find anything better been a family unit loving God and loving one another, whether the wife works in the home or outside of the home. Do, do you get the point that I'm making here? It isn't about what women should do as a career. It's about understanding 
what you are able to do and where your passion and your capabilities are leading you to at the moment. Verse 6, likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in your teaching show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. So he shifts the emphasis to the younger generation and says, live in such a way that you show yourself to be respectable and the good that you produce in your life. That's what good works are. You're producing a level of good that brings benefit to people around you. You're making other people's lives better. And in the words you say in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, meaning you search for a truth that rises above the chatter and the noise. That whether it's trendy or not, there is a truth that needs to be held on to that will actually shape your life and direct you in healthy paths. In other words, live well enough to silence your critics. I want to speak specifically to younger generations on this next point, and that is that God does not disregard you because of your youth. Paul wrote to another young man, Timothy, and in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, he writes, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Uh, uh, The first three words, let no one. So to the younger generation, let no one look down on you because you're young. There are unique benefits of being young in age that you will not always have throughout your life. And there may be people of older generations that you may feel are looking down on you because of your age. And you may feel like they just belittle you or that, oh, you don't know much or, oh, your feelings aren't valid. Let no one despise you because of your youthfulness. This is is God's inspired words. Now, how do you not let anyone look down on you because of your, your age? Your conduct. How you carry yourself, your demeanor, your words, your attitude. In other words, haters are going to hate, but live in such a way that you rise above them, that you prove them wrong. Live in such a way that you actually set an example in your speech, in your conduct, in how you love, in your faith, in what you believe, and in your purity of life. You catch what Paul is saying here? He's actually telling you, younger generation, you can be an example of faith that older people need to follow. Because there is one of the downfalls of growing older. And that is that you can take the passion that you once had for your convictions and your beliefs when you were young, and as you get older, your convictions and your beliefs may change, and sometimes we let our passion dwindle with it. Older generations, we recognize we need a reminder from the younger generation to keep your passions alive. That things that matter should be treated like they matter. And things that we love should be treated like we love them. So to young people, see yourself as capable, competent. God in you can and will do great things. You have got to believe that in whatever stage of life you are in, God wants to work in you and through you to accomplish a greater good. To the younger generation, do not see what you cannot do. That you have seen some history and you understand that, well, then maybe I don't have this opportunity that my parents or grandparents have. Do not focus on the opportunities you don't have or the things that you cannot do. Start dreaming about what you can do and about what God can and will do in your life. You can be a world changer for good at a very young age. Now here's a word about the passion there. Don't let your passion blind you to respect for the aged. Sometimes in our youthful passion, our passion and emotions may lead us, and our emotions may lead us more than logic and more than, more than wisdom will. That's that's part of life, and that is part of growing up. But understand, you may be passionate about some things, some ideas, and some needs, and older generation around you may, you may feel like that they don't see what you see, and they don't care about what you care about. 
I encourage you to show respect for people who are older than you, even if they don't exhibit the same passion and care that you do. I promise you this, younger people listen to me, I promise you this, despite what you may see or not see on the outside, there is a whole world working beneath the surface in the mind and the soul of people who are older than you, that they have experienced things you are unaware of, that you haven't yet experienced. They have gone through trials and have fought battles that you have no clue over. I promise you, younger generations, that people twice your age have gone through turmoil and struggles and trials that you know nothing about unless they just happen to let you in to see it. Older generations have fought battles in their soul and have endured difficulty that you are completely unaware of. Respect the fact that they have scars on their soul and it is changing perhaps the way their enthusiasm is carried out. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 32 says, You shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man and you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. There's teaching a reverence there for the older generation. It's recognizing that you have some good in this world in part because of what they have passed on to you, what they have done, what they have built, or what they have preserved. I recognize that there are individual exceptions to that. We're speaking broadly in generational terms. Instead of seeing an older generation as an opponent... See them as a source of wisdom and insight that could benefit you greatly. What if you learned their lessons without having to suffer their losses? They have something for you. Another bit of wisdom for younger generation, look past the annoyances to see their tremendous value. I get it. When you're young and you see the older generation, we don't move as fast as we once do, although I will still race you if you really, I mean, I'm willing. We don't move as fast. I ain't as good as I once was, but I'm as good once as I ever was. I really don't know what that means. It's a great line in that song, but I I don't know. Sometimes we get in your way. Sometimes we don't get the things that you like. Sometimes we don't like your fashion. Sometimes we don't like your music. Sometimes we don't like your entertainment. And sometimes we just get on your nerves. But you know what? Every generation has experienced that. And we old folks, we once were the rebels. We old folks, we were the ones that made the gray hairs scratch their head and wonder, what are they thinking? What kind of noise is this that they called music? Every generation has had that. And the ones that you may look to now in younger generation, you may look to them as, man, they just don't get it. They don't understand. I promise you they understand way more than you give them credit for. But also, I'm going to take this same truth, look past the annoyances, annoyances to see their tremendous value. That's also for the older folks. The younger generation may annoy you at times. You may get tired of walking through public places and having to dance around people taking selfies and filming videos and listening to music that you're like, I don't know what that is, I don't know what that means, and you may question their, their fashion and their taste. But there's still people. There's still souls that are equal in value to yours, and they still have the same basic needs of a human being as you do, and Jesus died for them just as well as he did for you, and you were once that age, and you once made your parents and your grandparents, the older generation, wonder what in the world am I passing America off to in this next generation? You had people question you and questioning your good sense. Why not show the younger generation a little bit of grace and let them grow up a little bit differently than you do? You want to protect them. You want to guard them. You want to pass on and instill in them the values that will preserve their souls and their future lives. You can and should do that. But understand, they're going to communicate it and display it in a different way than you did. There's a need for grace in the generations Deuteronomy 32, 7 says, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your father and he will show you. Your elders and they will tell you. Listen to the young people. I know we we older people, we get nostalgic. We like to talk about past experiences, past things we did. and, and, 
And in part, we're telling you those things because we do want you to know that we have gone through things that you're unaware of. And sometimes we tell you about these great memories we have and these great moments we have because we know what they meant to us and there's a part of us that wants you to experience something that good and that meaningful as well. We like to relive our memories because they're a treasured moment, probably at a moment when everything else in life was difficult, but there was something good and that carried us through. And so we like to relive those moments. So to the younger generation, be patient when it seems like sometimes we're talking about the good old days and speaking about the way it used to be. What we're really wanting to do is we're wanting you to know that there was good that we had in our lives and we wish you could get a glimpse of that as well. But on that note of the older generation talking about the past, here's some wisdom for the age. Do not confuse nostalgia with superiority or spirituality. Speaking especially to church people, people in my age group and older, it's easy for us to be nostalgic about what we once experienced, the way it used to be, and we think maybe it ought to be this way now. Don't confuse nostalgia with superiority. Just because that was the way it was when you were young and you were growing up doesn't mean that it's the best way because remember, what used to be your way was new to the people who came before you. Remember that what you look on now is the way it always was. It was not always that way. Someone was a trailblazer. Someone made a change. Someone rebelled and they started something new, a new way of doing things. Just because you experienced it doesn't mean that everybody else has to experience it the same way. Don't confuse nostalgia for some spiritual experiences you have as the way spirituality has to always be. This is a really big deal because sometimes churches get stuck in the past because they have equated their experiences with the way God says it's supposed to be. And it isn't. God works through each generation in different ways. Take a look at this scripture, Ecclesiastes 7.10. Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. We want to relive the moments we enjoyed. To us, it feels like this is the way it should always be, but understand that's a limited perspective. God did great things before you that you're unaware of. And in your time, God did great things and you experienced great moments, but do not think that that's exactly the way God has to move today or in future generations as well. The next generation must have their own moments. We in older generations have to recognize that God who said, Behold, I do a new thing, means that to every generation. He's doing something that is different than what the previous generations accepted and did. I recognize that people like me who grew up singing hymns like the old rugged cross in church, for us we think that's the gold standard for what music should be. But it isn't, because remember, that song was written almost 2,000 years after Jesus and the Apostles Just because something is dear to us doesn't mean it has to be dear to everyone. There are some traditions that we need to hold on to, that we need to guard and protect. But it is not a tradition of formality, of display. It is a tradition of truth. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 15, Paul says, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. So there are some things passed on from previous generations that we need to hold on to. They're truths that are of necessity and are of an unchanging nature. But they're not how we have applied them, which will change from season to season. Jesus said this in Mark chapter 7, verse 8, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And Jesus said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. Never regard your tradition as God's tradition. Never regard your experience of spirituality to be God's standard for spirituality. It is the truth that is unchanging, not our experience of it and not our application of it. If we don't recognize that, 
then what we will do is we will make a God out of our traditions and our customs, and we will make an idol out of our preferences and likes, and we will essentially shut out future generations who don't like what we like and who don't see what we see and don't enjoy what we enjoy. 30 years from now, God willing, if time should go on, 30 years from now, Liberty Hill Church should look different than it does today. It should be more vibrant. It should be more energetic. It should be more in love with Jesus and should be more effective at teaching people to follow Jesus than it is today. This church, as we know it now, should be surpassed by the next generation of people who will call Liberty Hill home. God forbid that any of us have met the last new people that ever come to Liberty Hill. We don't want to love our traditions and customs more than we love God's command to seek and to save that which was lost, to go into all the world and preach the gospels and make disciples of all nations. Love people more than we love our traditions and ease. Can I get an amen? So here's a thought to remember. The downside of growing older. I have an expiration date. I've checked. It's not printed on my back, but I've got one. There's a day that I'm going to breathe my last. My heart's going to stop beating. My brain's going to stop waving, and that's it for me on this earth. You've got one too. And when that day comes, it's going to be a blessing. It will be blessed to enter into heaven. But I want to put that date off as long as I can, not because I don't want to go to heaven, but because I want to do everything in my power and ability to make my life better for my wife, my kids, and my friends, and my neighbors, and my community, and my church, that until the day I die, I want to do everything I can to bring more good into the world. That's a blessing, and it is a taste of heaven on earth. So I want to ask you, have you thought about the fact that you've got an expiration date? And how is that affecting how you treat the next generation that's coming up in your place? I want to end with Psalm 90, verse 12. So teach us, Lord, to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. The idea that we ask God to teach us to number our days, our years, months. No, he says number our days. I mean, number your moments. Measure the moments you have in life. That you get a wisdom to know what is good and what is great. That you get a wisdom to separate what is interesting from what is most important. That you separate what you like from what is necessary. And if you and I number our days and we understand that there is a time when I'm going to leave this life and enter into the next, then we begin to prepare for it. And the way to prepare for that is to understand that there is a God who gave you life. It belongs to Him. And how will you stand before Him when your life returns to Him? Will you stand guilty of rejecting Him? Will you stand guilty of building other gods and following your own desires or will you say thank you God that you offered me your son the way, the truth and the life if you're in this room and you've never accepted Christ as your Lord your leader, your your savior, your forgiver you can do that right here, right now in just a moment we're going to stand and sing and if this is your moment that you've made the decision to follow Jesus, I ask you to please step out from where you're seated and come forward. Our prayer team that's to my left would love to pray with you. They want to know about this decision of faith that you're making. And they'll do their best to answer questions you may have. Or maybe you want to pray for someone you love. Maybe you want to pray for other generations. Then they want to pray with you for that as well. Those of you that are watching online, if you're making that decision today to follow Jesus, we want to celebrate with you encourage you and pray for you so please let us know let's stand together as we sing and as we pray Thank you.
Come on, let's sing it together, church. I love you, Lord. extremely grateful that I am a different person today than I was 10 years ago. But even more than that, I'm more thankful that there was a generation that was willing to pour into me despite my ignorance, despite the dumb things that I did in the world. There was a generation that was willing to love me and I, I pray that in the future that there is a generation that is able to look at me and say, he loved me so much that despite the ignorance, despite the bad things that I've done, he was still willing to pour into me for the future of the church. Because I hope you've enjoyed your time together here. And I hope you have a blessed Sunday. On your way out, make sure you grab one of those QR code cards out in the lobby and give that to somebody this week and invite them to church on Easter. Have a blessed Sunday. <laughs>